Good morning, everybody. It's nice to uh, welcome you here, and it's it's particularly nice to see some some old familiar faces uh, that have returned um, to honor Domingo Miela. Uh, my name is Stephen Fraley. I'm the uh, editor of Dear Dave magazine, and I also have the great pleasure of uh, occupying a couple of different academic positions at School of Visual Arts in photography. But enough about me. Um, let, let's talk about Domingo. Domingo Miela, as you probably know, is represented by the Grimaldi Gavin Gallery in London and has had three solo exhibitions at the gallery. And he's also had two at Tracy Williams Gallery here in New York. His work has been exhibited at the, at the Venice Biennale uh, and at Les, Les Recontes des Halles, which I'm probably mispronouncing, published in the New York Times Magazine, Foam Magazine, Dear Dave, and Wallpaper. He is a graduate from the BFA Photography Department at SVA in 2005, and we gather here today to celebrate the publication of his very beautiful monograph published by Steitel in 2014. Um, without any further delay, uh, well, Domingo's gonna talk for a while, and then he and I are gonna have a conversation uh, together, and in also including all of you in that conversation. So without any further delay, please welcome D Domingo Miela. Hello, it's almost talking to a family because it's most of affections are sitting in the audience, so we'll make it intimate, but uh, I still have to uh, enter the body of work that we will do with uh, just something very brief I wrote uh, uh, this morning. Uh, on Mondays, a few blocks uh, down on 23rd Street, during my freshman year, 14 years ago, there was a lecture series. It was one of my favorite classes uh, to sit in the dark here it's a little bit brighter, but there it was darker in the old theater. To sit in the dark and listen to the adventures of these artists. Uh, today I'm honored and I'm thankful with Stephen and Maria to make this possible. Uh, New York has given me a passport uh, to my own culture, strangely, and arriving at SVA from a conformist traditional culture like Italy, it was very liberating, challenging, and new. It allowed me to look back slowly and clearly to my own culture, as much as it showed me that a culture can never really enter one other culture. We need confrontation and freedom to find our roots. 10 years after my graduation, I want to thank you guys for this possibility and this lesson, which includes freedom, expression, and art. Um, I will start, uh, um, weirdly enough, chronologically, because it's my work It's I think, essentially about time. And this is... Um, the picture with which I usually begin uh, from 2004, it's the apartment buildings uh, across the window of the house where I grew up. Um, and it represents the suburbs of any city, but in this case, it's my city. So it's almost like being uh, in love and being affectionate with something um, anonymous or generic. But the weird thing is that also my family was part of the uh, entrepreneur endeavor to build this. So in a certain way, uh, since early on, I discovered that the interest that picture allowed me to explore was uh, love, belonging, through architecture uh, and through the, rep through the representation of what it can mean. Um, but in a certain way, my body of work uh, really begins in 2004 uh, with a very special experience that it's entangled with SVA as well. Uh, I was uh, unhappy about making pictures in New York after four years. Uh, pictures were not coming out. Pictures were not interesting. Uh, I was mostly photographing in Italy and bringing back to the darkroom on 21st Street uh, apartment buildings like the one where I grew up or different, but it wasn't really evolving what I was looking for. So one day I met, uh, before spring break, Stephen in the elevator of the school, uh, and he said, that there was a small school in Mexico City asking us to uh, exchange students. He didn't know anything about this school. He would have gone a few days after, and he said, why don't you organize a group of your friends to go uh, look at this place instead of uh, going on holiday for spring break, just go to Mexico. And eventually I went there, and um, I asked him on my way back to Mexico to just move me into this university for a whole semester, and that eventually happened. 
happened and this uh, early uh, kind of loss of virginity uh, was through this gift he gave me and the coincidence of Mexican culture. This is the square of the three cultures uh, where the Spaniards built with the same brick of the Mayan, of the Aztec pyramid, uh, the convent of Tlatelolco, and then the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Mexico built his own skyscraper on the top of another twin pyramid. So in a certain way, it's a picture that shows uh, the violence uh, and the body of colonization. Uh, but Mexico was um, a far more liberating environment because it was a city, a village, uh, an archaeological ruin of the present. It looked almost like a medieval futuristic city. And uh, when I took this picture, still in 2008, it was Mexican culture that showed me and indicated me a way back uh, to Italy, to medieval painting, uh, to Giotto, as if the city was containing a certain kind of archaic um, memory. And the, the archaeology uh, that is taken out of the underground, uh, like in this picture, paradoxically comes uh, back to the underground. Uh, this is a subway stop called Beautiful Arts, Bellas Artes. This is also Mexico City. I decided in this uh, prolific presentation, because there is many images we will go through, to also include um, works uh, of other artists in time that connect with uh, some form of sentimental, uh, intellectual, or just aesthetic uh, bridge. This is Cima da Conegliano, a Venetian painter from the late 1400s, famous for its very cold light. I, early on in the development of my work, uh, beside architecture, I was very fascinated by um, funerary architecture. Also because in a certain way, cemeteries um, are uh, architectural models of each culture that builds them. And they also cannot be dwelled in the present, but they are dwelled by memory. This, I think, relates to another um, interesting thing I discovered through photography, which is the relationship with memory and writing memory, which it means also building memory. And the cemeteries of Muslim culture uh, build uniform uh, sculptural models with no sex, no hierarchy, no social class. There was something interesting about this elegance and this uniformity of memory. Um, this is in Albania in 2008. It is a it's a strange picture because it's not usual for me to have people, there, is, there are very few, but in this case, for me, this picture was m a kind of metaphor. There is a family being portrayed in a pristine forest. And uh, this is early on in the development of digital uh, cameras being diffused in the world. And I could see around, like, like, like a tree with a large camera settled on the land I always saw things happening around me while photographing. And one thing that happened during the last 10, 15 years, it was the prolification of other picture takers, other people taking pictures around me. And this image represents in a certain way uh, this moment of picture taking of the others. But water in the back of my camera springs out of a mountain. It's a natural spring, it's called Blue Eye, and this river is born out of nowhere uh, the main difference between analog and digital is the existence of water. Um, film cannot be produced without water. Paper cannot be produced without water. Uh, negative cannot be developed without water. Essentially, I think the main distinction between digital and analog is the presence or the absence of water. In 2009, um, I began uh, probably the most challenging part of this body of work, which was to try to photograph my own country. Uh, and Italy has an incredible heritage of image making. And it's, uh, it was uh, hard to do it with photography because also there is an imagery of Italy that regards the sun, the tourism, the leisure, 
and I wanted to bring uh, pictures of Italy back to some kind of pictorial quality. This is nearby where I grew up. It's called Polignano Mare. It's a city built like a ship. This is a Rorni Orn, petrified glass. It's, uh, it's a series that has different names. They are uh, by Rorni Orn. Uh, they are um, called, I mean, they are cast of uh, glass. Uh, baked to a point in which they become uh, completely transparent. So they're only uh, opaque on the sides and they are like, they represent this kind of frozen uh, glass that looks the most similar to frozen water. They absorb light and uh, give light out. It's glass, but it's something to do with photography and water, which I think it's probably the connective element. And also, perhaps I choose some of these things just because they're very beautiful. Um, even though I came to study in the States, something very strange happened to me in New York City that I was enjoying a lot of American photography, but the true um, encounter for me was with, the, as an Italian, New York taught me uh, German art in a very strange way, and especially German photography. And this is a picture of the late 70s by Thomas Truth uh, of a street in Dusseldorf, part of a very long series that he did for 20 years called Unconscious Places. Um, but what really matters for me in this picture is this idea that the city uh, can represent uh, its own history. So this, this kind of post-war grief of Germany is perfectly evident in the architecture and consequentially perfectly evident in the picture. Uh, this is an old formation of lava under the Etna in 2008 uh, with the people, young uh, adolescent looking at the, at the sundown. So uh, I think in the development of the work there is an interesting moment after the first years of experiment in which I really start to see that I want to compress extreme different ages and extreme different moments of history, be it geologic, be it archaeologic with the present. So try to make pictures of the present in dialogue with another time, a much larger time, which can be natural or cultural. Sicily, 2009. And this was uh, a, mar a landmark picture in the development of this idea of time. It was like receiving a... Um, uh, kind of a slice of a birthday cake, a, a set of layers uh, in which we go from uh, caves of the Paleolithic to building of the 70s. In the same picture, uh, it's, it's very hard w working analogically and working uh, with straight photography. To f you, are, you have to completely surrender to reality. There is no artifice, there is no vanity, there is no lies. It's either the place, it's either the time, it's the here and now that obliges you to make pictures in a certain way. And this was a gift uh, during the first day of January in the province of Taranto, in the region where I'm from, where I found this kind of uh, uh, model of layers, uh, all in one. In 2009, I spent a long time in Cairo, which, like Mexico City, revealed to be this uh, uh, dream under construction or this dream under destruction a sort of um, ruin of the present. Uh, there is an adolescent putting bricks in line at the bottom of the picture. You can see him kneeling down and he's trying to make his own little order in the middle of this kind of catastrophe. Uh, he's doing a kind of a little bit of a Carl Andre uh, anonymous piece in the middle of uh, the aftermath of an earthquake or the building uh, of a possibility. The desert uh, proceeds and consumes the city. Modernity tried to build a sort of uh, tolerant, sustainable model for the world of mechanic housing, and the ancient culture built something that lasts longer than his own memory. Um, I'm again 
kind of grateful with Egypt uh, to show me this. Uh, as the Arab saying, uh, they use a lot in Cairo, it says, man is afraid of time, but uh, time is afraid of the pyramids. I think that it's still the case. This is Francis Frith. It's interesting that photography, in a certain way, we underestimate the way it was born and the way it came to us. It's, it's born in the same time in which we really become archaeologic cultures, meaning we start to read uh, and decode the most ancient languages. We start to dig uh, systematically uh, the um, Mediterranean, and we invent I mean, moving machines that will change the face of the world. It's interesting, the coincidence of this, the explosion of archaeology and the codification of time with the invention of photography. They come together. I don't know much about it. I just think it's an interesting coincidence. This is, again, in Cairo, the Copt ghetto, where they recycle um, garbage by hand, metal, plastic, organic. All gets done by people, by hand, and they live in this kind of futuristic city with uh, satellite dishes and a kind of um, medieval fortress, uh, which to me looks more of a city of the future than a city of the past. This is a, a day view of the same uh, uh, neighborhood. They have these cage cages on the top of buildings that you see there. They are pigeon cages. They collect eggs and they eat pigeons. It's one of the most refined uh, food in the ghetto. This is Antonello da Messina. Continuing in, in this um, task to try to photograph Italy, um, I really couldn't um, find a position that was constructive about the present, because the present in Italy, like in any other Western country, is really about building roads, uh, new uh, architecture with no identity, and building this kind of weird space of highways and airports and shopping malls. I think this is the dominant cipher of the last 20 years of our civilization. So I actually wanted to defend myself from this, and I tried to travel back in time and bring uh, a vision of the south of Italy that was linked to this archaic and medieval struggle of this town that was built on the top of hills to hide from uh, Ottoman uh, attacks, to hide from the arrival of Longobards and uh, Normans, uh, this kind of defensive nature of the landscape, uh, which is also kind of very poetic and very um, organic. This is also uh, in the same province uh, next to my city, near uh, in Taranto. It's ca called Castellaneta. Weird enough, this is the town where uh, the main actor of mute Hollywood movies, Rudolf Valentine, was born. So uh, the most famous of uh, actors in the 30s came from this archaic lost place that looks almost like more Afghanistan than, uh, than Europe. And the river comes through uh, the canyon only in winter when, um, when there is a lot of rain uh, falling consequentially. This is Pietra Pertosa, also another town hiked up in the mountains uh, between Napoli and uh, Bari in the center of the south of Italy. Venetian painting is uh, a, a great passion of mine. I think uh, this is also Cima da Conegliano, which like Giovanni Bellini and Mantegna, they were the first to portray this kind of uh, delicate relationship of the mother and child. I mean, this kind of more human uh, sense of compassion, but also uh, meditation and delicacy. I think I was very influenced in this idea of light and this idea of, of, of suspended time uh, by this aesthetic. We get now to the, the last part uh, of this journey that took 10 years and now it's compressed in a few minutes, um, where I started accidentally to confront this idea of writing on the landscape or writing on the stone. This is the last inscription of a lost empire, which is uh, called the Hittites. Uh, it's from 1200 BC, so it's like 3,000 to 100 years ago. And it's a father uh, that tells to his son about all the principle and all the ethics of the values of their civilization. W wind, 
blows, snowfalls. The writing is slowly disappearing. We can barely decode it. Uh, we can barely read it. Uh, I met a person that has been working on this inscription for the last 42 years. He has only got through half of it. Van Gogh. Bruce Nauman. This is uh, in Frigia. It's a stone that has been carved and welded by at least five different civilizations. In the back of this stone, uh, after two years I did this picture, I came back to look at this formation again, and I discovered there was an, an, Hellenistic, an Hellenistic tomb with Greek inscriptions that I couldn't see the first time I photographed it. So, and this is right across this more important monument, uh, which kind of compresses the whole topic of what I try to do with pictures. Um, we know uh, it's the tomb of uh, King Midas, the Phrygian king that was punished by um, Zeus because he was, he asked um, to have the gift of turning everything he touched into gold. He eventually uh, was granted this gift and he died of hunger. One myth says, one other myth says he was turned uh, into a donkey. Um, one other myth said he was punished and dissolved in a river. Myths are very uh, imprecise and confusing, but the interesting thing is that the gate um, to, to the underworld or the gate to the afterlife of, of Midas is inscribed in this beautiful manner uh, on this form of rock. And I decided to portray myself photographing with a digital camera. It's a self-portrait. Uh, photographing with a digital camera this, this passage we can't go through. Uh, I think we don't understand really what's happening to our culture through dig digitalization. We, we don't have a grasp of this. I wanted to make pictures that absorb at least the questions we confront. The fascinating thing that in the inscriptions around the tomb are in an alphabet that we can read, but we don't know the vowels. It's Phrygian, it's an old form of Greek and Phoenician mixed together. So it's like a car we can't drive. We can sit in, we can turn it on, but we can't make it go. Uh, I thought it was a very good metaphor to talk about the present. So we can read mitas, mida, but we don't have the tools to make it go. Recently, uh, I came across this early uh, version of, uh, of this uh, version of the Phaedro from, Pla uh, from Plato, from the 50s. All my philologist friends told me that we read, we know how it sounds like, but we can't say what uh, the inscription of mida says. I came across this book by chance this summer, and at page um, 131, this is in Italian, I'm sorry, but Socrates tells to Fredro that you talk rhetorically just like the inscription above the tomb of Midas. And Fredro asks Socrates, so what does this inscription say? And it says, the bronze virgin that I am, I am above the uh, tomb of Midas until water will flow and the tall trees will rise here on this tomb, full of tears, I will tell to the passerbys that Midar here is, burned, is buried. So in a certain way, what was unreadable for the philologist, what was unreadable for me, has come after five years through the pages of, um, of Plato. So it kind of smelled like the right path. In Turkey, uh, traveling in Anatolia uh, and uh, traveling in the old Greek part of Turkey, because the, the Greek world in reality was a much larger community that included most of the central part of Turkey until all of Sicily uh, and at the gates of Naples in the central part of Italy. So it was a much larger world than what we imagine. Um, and the, the Lichens, which was this r remote population in the east-south of Turkey, built these incredible uh, cliff tombs but the main one in the center that we see from 3000 BC, 300 BC was left unfinished. So it, I thought it was fascinating that a culture so refined and so remote in time left to us something incomplete. And that, that, that can't be finished because of course we can't call the legions back to life and their culture to finish this work. Uh, the legion built interesting uh, funerary monuments because they reproduced uh, the wood house 
of their daily life. But the wood, of course, has disappeared. We don't have anything of that. But we are left with the cast of the same shape of wood into funerary sculptures on the, um, granite. So in a certain way, the support on which we decide to write becomes the meaning. So uh, in this moment of cell phones and social medias and uh, Twitter, it's kind of interesting to think that we say relevant, the relevant things, but in reality, it's like writing uh, with water on sand. Uh, so I have a lot of questions about this idea of writing. Um, this is Pollock. A, a body of work that inf influenced me a lot, which is not so well received and I think understood, uh, also by Thomas Struth, is in the series he did in the 90s called New Pictures from Paradise, which talks about very similar things that I talked about as far as now. It's uh, this idea of making pictures that show you the impossibility to look through, uh, the idea of paradise as a, an unreachable utopia, uh, a picture that doesn't show you, but puts you again in the position of the viewer and puts you again in the thinking mode. Instead of offering a solution, it triggers you a possible uh, answer or a possible reflection. This is Salerno, 1990, by Andreas Gursky. There is not much to explain. Uh, it was one of my favorite pictures of Italy I had seen uh, through the history of photography. This is in Kurdistan. It's a, an early Muslim community coming from Persia and building this very modern uh, black and brown graveyards. And uh, getting to the last part of the work now, uh, I even accelerated in 2012 and 2013 trying to photograph a uh, form of writings that were fascinating to me. This is new Assyrian of the kingdom of Urartu, a kingdom in the mountain between Armenia and Iran. And we could say that if there was an iPad, an iPad 8.8 .8 of ancient writing, this would be it. It was the newest of the oldest form uh, of writing. And then cuneiform eventually disappeared after this version. So it's the most stylized, clean way of writing uh, with cuneiform, but of course the picture is also about landscape and about the book of landscape, I would call it, and the gravel. Uh, I had to move the gravel to clean the space for the photograph, but the gravel eventually is coming back down. The serious Bacchus of Saitombli. the young portraits of uh, Germans from the middle of the 80s by Thomas Ruff. I think I'm very fascinated by this work of Ruff because I, I think it's a bit this, the face of history, or I could say the gaze of history, through the eyes of the state, the eyes of power, or just the eyes of photography. Uh, this is Boetti and it says, divine abstractions. And this leads to the last part of the work from 2013, which I'll show you now. It's, uh, this is another self-portrait of me looking at the inscription of an Hittite king that conquered a new land, and uh, he misbehaved, and he wrote above an older inscription of, an, of a previous king his own name, and eventually the Assyrian came in and, and substituted him with an, an eunuch. But the point is not this. The, the point is that a king uh, 800 years before Christ makes his signature on this very mysterious and special place uh, on this dormant volcano. Another king 400 years comes afterwards and makes his own sign above the sign of the previous one. And when I took the picture, I was absolutely unaware of this. I just did it by heart. But actually, I was also here on the right um, trail so it's me looking at this inscription on lava stone. The Hittite always chose lava as the support of their pages. So basalt was their own paper. And they always chose places perfectly aligned with underground rivers or with the sunrise and the sundown. This work made me think a lot about a beautiful 
probably my, my favorite work of Michelangelo, which is the Sacristia Nuova in Florence, um, where, where he portrays this idea of time. Um, and the young captain of the Medici family, um, Lorenzo, is uh, portrayed uh, as the meditative. Day and night are represented as female and men on the side of the sepulchres. Underground rivers for the Hittite were incredibly important. They thought that where a river would come out of the land uh, was a sign of divine um, prophecy or divine abundance, but also where a river would disappear was a way to communicate with the underworld. Um, this is an inscription where a king uh, and a queen uh, try to make a deal offering food and water to the gods. The fascinating thing about Hittites is they are like comic books. Um, what they say is represented above the heads uh, of the figures, so it's like a comic book from uh, 1600. They imitated Egyptian hieroglyphs but used uh, Babylonian grammar and Assyrian verbs. Uh, they mixed a whole knowledge of the past into something kind of free and new. So they're like the, the most free of the uh, archaic uh, cultures. And then you see on the, almost where the shadow is, there is three fishes going down. And in the shadow, um, two years after I did the picture, I discovered that the author write, wrote uh, to my beloved daughter, which we can't read in the shadow, but I was told that's what it says. This is also Hittite on, on lava near uh, a river that doesn't flow anymore. This is the negative version of the inscriptions. They are very fascinating and very beautiful. And to me, uh, this aesthetic phenomenon, yes, it related with photography. Yay, yes, it related with writing. But I also related a lot with this new thing we're witnessing. Maybe we're not aware of, and we should pay more attention, that we're starting to communicate again with images and emoticons, uh, Instagram, and uh, Facebook favors for you, the adolescent, a new world of imagery, but how prepared and how cultivated are we about images and how do we use them? I think there is a lot of questions into this which I'm not able to solve, but at least I'm, I'm asking. It's the same difference between sex and love. Uh, this is Christopher Wool. Uh, I think this idea of communicating with images can be easily pornographic. And I think we are facing a question about pictures that mean something and pictures that just violate and express something uh, like pornography. A Greek broken uh, page in Arsenia. The tomb of uh, Antiochus I, uh, a very arrogant king that built a fake mountain on the top of the highest mountain of Mesopotamia. And eventually the gods he represented were, they were decapitated by lightning strikes, earthquakes, and rain and wind. This is the highest mountain looking down at the border of Syria and uh, Kurdistan. This is probably 50 or 90 miles from the headquarters of ISIS. Uh, I took this picture before the conflict started. Uh, I took this picture before ISIS was invented, but the decapitation was already uh, in the air. A queen and a prince going to a god that it's in the shadow that was erased by time. So the Hittite figures go towards something that is not there anymore. Double self portrait of Jeff Wall. And then uh, we finish with some more unreadable Frisian writing. Uh, as I wanted to get, go back to this ballet in the center of Anatolia and visit again these beautiful um, inscriptions like wind or like tattoos uh, that are still undecipherable for us, as I think it's very undecipherable, the present. And the boat uh, of the Greek um, Navi League of Rolls is also inscribed in stone against a wave of uh, against a wave of stone. So th I think this is the question about the navigability of our culture today. How do we sail, or where are we going? Um, it's a bit the question 
uh, that I'm asking myself. And um, I finish with a tribute to, um, I think, the body of work that has changed the face of photography in the last century. And the backers have been, um, for me, a sort of a, a light through the night. Uh, and once the death of Villa is very recent, uh, I thought that um, it was meaningful to think again of photography as a, a very ethical medium that can make us rethink uh, the society we live aesthetically. And so uh, I'd like to finish with this. I've been thinking about your work for a couple of days now, uh, which has been a great pleasure. And one of the things that I learned, uh, I per perhaps I had an inkling of it before this, but one of the things that was really pinpointed to me, and I think that you mentioned this, um, I think that you mentioned this in one of, one of your inter interviews, is that the, the work has a, a very emotional uh, basis. It, it is not work that's in the uh, tradition of a sort of detached topographical imagery, but um, for you it's an emotional experience. Uh, you, you mentioned love in your conversation and you mentioned grief. And I also think that the inclusion of some of the paintings from the, from, from the past, um, it, th there's a feeling of sorrow, uh, a feeling of sadness. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a question or, or just a comment. Uh, again, this, sort of, this just sort of emotional um, bedrock of your, of your work becomes very clear to me. Is this true, Domingo? <laughs> but this is hard to answer. I think it's true that um, we are surrounded by very, I think it's true that we are surrounded by very impersonal art and very um, technical art. So I think that it was, um, I mean, I don't judge myself as uh, sentimental, uh, definitely loving or uh, interested or passionate. Uh, but I think the work, uh, it's probably uh, romantic in the most dry of, uh, and hopeful of ways. It's a, I think it's a desire to make a bridge towards something uh, lost or about to be lost to recover it. I've, uh, I think I've always been fascinated by art that was helping something that was about to be lost or forgotten. I think there is something uh, like um, meaningful in that. Well, I, I, yes, the work is romantic, as you just said, but, but in a larger historical sense that I think, you know, em embraces uh, literary traditions and, and um, you know, and, 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 and different, uh, different trains of thought. I also think you, the work is about disappearance, which, is, which, which I think you just mentioned, that it's as much about the thing not there, or the rem obviously the trace, the remnant of the thing, as the thing itself. I think it's a lot about that, not only because I am this person, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also because the medium I chose and the time we are living are a lot about this. Mm -hmm. If you think also of our schools, Stephen, mm -hmm. I mean, only uh, 10 years ago, we were all working in a certain way in dark rooms mm -hmm. with a certain tradition that lasted 100 years to get to that mm -hmm. point. And now, for example, you had to rework the whole format of photography mm -hmm. to attract young people Every year we have to rethink it, yeah. And in a certain way, I think it's kind of fascinating because photography was born and it is a certain way the perfect medium of memory. Mm -hmm. It was really kind of born mostly, I think, out of that uh, desire to record mm -hmm. as all forms of modernity and, and writing. So in a certain way, the moment we kind of got it is the moment in which we lost it. Right. I think this is um, well. Photography there's is in, something weird about yeah, this passage, right? Photography is is in, is inherently about the, about the past immediately. But I also think that um, one of the things that your work also embraces is the future. By by showing us the layering of of, of, of history, I think that it makes us more aware of the fact that whatever the present is will soon become become the past, and will soon be. Uh, obscured by another layer of history. But, and probably uh, the symbols that art can produce mm -hmm. can be a bridge 
uh, to make this better mm -hmm. or to make this more meaningful mm -hmm. instead of just wiping out or excluding things mm -hmm. and removing things. Right. Uh, I think the wealth of culture has always been the ability to absorb and re reformulate and mm -hmm. recreate something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not definitely uh, destruction, mm -hmm. it's the opposite. I mean, recollection is a way to make um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the gap, I think. I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not an historian. I'm, uh, well, I do things I love. I don't it's interesting to hear you talk about the work also in relationship to what you learned afterwards. You've, you mentioned that a couple of times. I mean, I think your work is such an act of connoisseurship and there's obviously there's research that goes into into the itinerary and into what you're going to. But a couple of times you mentioned facts that you only learned about a particular site afterwards. I, but I, it, I don't proceed scientifically. I no. mean, the passion for German photography yeah. is mostly aesthetic, but mm -hmm. I definitely work like an Italian. Mm -hmm. I mean, I discover while I do something. I don't anticipate. Yeah. Uh, I have intuitions. But archaeology, for example, I mean, most of the work about, I put this mosaic because there is, uh, yeah. uh, it's the, the synthesis of all, especially the bottom part, all the work mm -hmm. on archaeology. I really just went to these places and I was centrally moved by them. Mm -hmm. And then I read. Often I would not read much before to go. Okay. I would see oh. a, a, a postcard, I would see an encyclopedia. I would have a kind of uh, so it's, hint it's or, or a friend would send me a picture like, Mm -hmm. Lee that sent me the picture of the tomb of King Midas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went there once, I went there twice, and then I learned at SOAS in London with the philologist all this problem after I did the mm -hmm. picture. So mm -hmm. it's beautiful because I think mm -hmm. it's about not dominating but uh, listening. Right. Uh, so I listen well, which, to pictures and sure. they, come, they, they help me or they tell me stories that I would not know right. otherwise. Well, it's the perfect situation to use photography as a way of learning. And, and, and as, a cons as a constant way of learning. Yes, because I think photography sometimes anticipates us, mm -hmm. or I think our right. intelligence is really limited visually. Mm -hmm. So sometimes visual things teach us things, and they anticipate. They anticipate. I think they also relate with the unconscious a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the body, of, I mean, that work of Thomas Struth about the city, mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting because it's an empty, grid that comes to you from reflection. Mm -hmm. It comes to you afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's not evident when you see right. it. It comes from the experience of the photograph or the listening to the sound of the photograph instead of like saying, this is beautiful, this is ugly, this is valuable, this is invaluable. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. It's like, let me use a picture to mm -hmm. allow you something. One of the things I find myself uh, saying to the students uh, pretty frequently is that the, the, the photographs are of often smarter than we are, or if not smarter. Or stupid, or more stupid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The two. Right. But, but I, I, I think that they can be uh, the harbinger of what we will know. Um, and the making of photography is a way of learning, is a, is a way of understanding. But you have, to, you have to look at the pictures long enough to let them reveal their secrets to you. It's, uh, it's almost, there is something sacred, mm -hmm. which I think is also the subject of this body of work. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I, I, did, I did not know, but I was really looking for places that had some kind of value beyond my knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, beyond my experience, or they just had something valuable mm -hmm. that was rooted and, 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 and meaningful. And I think this is the places where I went to, right. naturally. Do you, um, do, you, do you have an interest in American? Um, I mean, obviously our history, our uh, paleontology is, is much more shallow than, than Europe, but, I w and I was also thinking of, um, I mean, you're very generous in terms of, in, in terms of citing, citing your, uh, your references and those whose work you honor. I was thinking uh, yesterday of Richard Mizrock's work and especially the work that takes, the, the, some of the early work that takes place in the desert. Desert Cantos. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 I looked at it probably when I was ni 18, 19. Mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. inspired me. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was the first photographer of whom I heard that was going around with this big wood camera mm -hmm. on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So this teacher at a class at NYU before I came to SVA mm -hmm. told the story of him going into the desert with his camera. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first person that hit me as an image of somebody mm -hmm. deciding to be in the desert mm -hmm. with this big wood camera and tripod. And like, I, I just thought it was very beautiful, this. this uh, but why no pictures in the American desert? 
No, I, I mean, I, not that I'm, not, I'm proposing your, an obligation. No, I think that this, as far as now, this body of work was very mm -hmm. worried about identity. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Artistic identity, uh, cultural identity. I think I was, I felt so much pressure to find this as an artist. Mm -hmm. I don't know, for many reasons, personal, mm -hmm. historical, mm -hmm. uh, that I think I um, focused on, on really the history of uh, my culture. Right. So this driving to Mesopotamia, I didn't even understand why I was mm -hmm driving for three times by car from the south of Italy to Mesopotamia. Right. It's like the most, I would never accept this journey, mm -hmm. not even if somebody treated me with a gun to go back there. Mm -hmm. no, it's like, I, it was a kind of pull. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, you have so Maybe it changes, I yeah. hope it changes. I mean, I hope it, it changes. I don't want to be mm -hmm. uh, stuck in this uh, philologic mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, journey. I'd like to do other things too. Well, you have been very clear in your relationship to your hometown, Bari, and um, how influential it's been in, in terms of a layering of, of, of different civilizations, and also about your journey from there. Yeah, so true. going out, the, it, it, it's strange, that's very true. It's like the same way I decided to bring pictures of that city here in New York mm -hmm. and go to the Darkham on 21st Street and then show in class the, this picture that everybody found incredibly boring, mm -hmm. just because I was affectionate mm -hmm. with this place. Mm -hmm. I mean, Patrick remembers, it was, it was <laughs> dreadful. It was like the most boring thing, but because I thought they were meaningful for me. Uh, so there was already kind of recovery of mm -hmm. some kind of affection or belonging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and speaking of that era, I think, again, that, that picture that you made in Mexico City, you know, with the three mm -hmm. distinct uh, monuments of different civilizations, I really think that was the turning point. Yeah, and, I think and, that was the picture, yeah. And, and how you began to understand what your what your journey was. Mexico, you see, that's uh -huh. interesting though, because that was a free step. New York it was a, a free step, a oh, step of okay. freedom. Yeah. Because Mexico kind of showed me a theme that was inside me mm -hmm. through his own uh, architectural uh, history mm -hmm. or shape. Right. Like he showed me, look, it was like a, 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 a beaming light on mm -hmm. a subject. He said, look mm -hmm. at this. Then I eventually understood that going back uh, mm -hmm. to the Mediterranean was right. meaningful. Right. But, I think early on I was more free than now. Mm -hmm. I had to, ca I think an artist needs to cage himself to find mm -hmm. out if he's really interested in something, then maybe you can go out of the cage. I think, I don't know. Well, this uh, is the old way of thinking. Yeah. Probably it's not, it's out of fashion. Well, speaking of that, I mean, w are you going to continue to add to this body of work or is the body of work? Well, there is one picture mm -hmm. that I put at the end. I wasn't showing it to be, uh, which I did, uh, a month, two months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very ancient uh, bull mm -hmm. from 9,000 years before Christ. But I'm also looking at graffiti from the present. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to look at the sign as a general thing instead of an archeologic right. thing. And the drawing is also much more free thing than alphabet or, mm -hmm. or, or, or tombs mm -hmm. or very precise gestures. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm interested in the Paleolithic, but I'm also interested in teenage right. emoticon. I mean, emoticon and yeah. the Paleolithic. I think this is what I'm. Uh, I find that so uh, really wonderful that, that your your openness to um, contemporary forms of communication. Which, when when I fir when I was thinking about the picture of you standing there with a cell phone uh, in front of the tomb, I thought that it might be a bit of a critique. I thought it might be a bit of a satire on the superficiality of, of um, cell phone photography. But I can tell, I mean, as you talk about it, it's not. It's not at all. I think it's the cipher of uh, mm -hmm. Louis, the Italian photographer, which I discovered very late, mm -hmm. Luigi Ghirri, mm -hmm. which is being evaluated Amazing. now. And yeah. it was, when, we, when I came to SVA, there was not even a book in the library. Mm -hmm. So it didn't exist there in still the world. There might not be. Who no, no, the, okay. I'm sure now there is. But yeah. he, he said this very beautiful thing about trying to capture the cipher of the age. Mm -hmm. I'm try, he said, I'm trying to decode the total hieroglyphic mm -hmm. and trying to find out ciphers that explain my age. Mm -hmm. I think the cell phone is just the cipher of mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't put the cell phone, the picture would have been very archaeologic. And I don't want to make, ar I don't want to make pictures yeah. of archaeology. And for me, the interest is the present. Right. Well, putting the, putting the figure, whether it's your figure or not, is, is clearly a, a, you know, a reference to the history of uh, photography of exploration in terms, in terms of scale itself. Right. That's why I also introduced Frit. Yeah in that kind of idea of discovering time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we discovered the tool of capturing time 
and we very early on use it mostly to record uh, forms of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, I think we talk about photography so often without uh, the tools and mm -hmm. reflecting on its, re on its nature of the, the palimpsest, it's the relationship Palimps. with time. Yeah. It's like how can, it's like wanting to cook without salt. Mm -hmm. It's like it's always gonna be sh kind of, it's like, I don't know, advertising can't do that mm -hmm. because you have a beautiful, lin in Italy now during Christmas it's gonna be covered of lingerie advertising, all in red, all these beautiful girls mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. underwear in red. It's like, it's an epidemic in Italy. Uh -huh. But this, that photography and that idea of picture, mm -hmm. I think it's what dominates our imagery of mm -hmm. pictures, mm -hmm. willing or unwilling. So to come to the other side and try to make something that comes back to the palimpsest, mm -hmm. it's very hard, but I think that's what I'm interested in. I think one of the ways that you, that you describe that, that palimpsest <coughs> is many cases when you make the picture, you are, you are hovering above the, uh, the, the the landscape, the scenario. And I, you know, on, on one hand, that's a conventional way of recording the landscape, but I think it also allows you to layer different, different time periods, especially the, some of the pictures in Egypt and, and, and in Mexico. So we start with the, pres yeah, we start with yeah. the present and then, and then show that. Uh, I think probably that was a very didascalic, like a very illustrational need mm -hmm. to be clear on the subject. Mm -hmm. Maybe now I think I'm becoming closer and I'm not worried about this. I think the layering can be in the message. Mm -hmm. I think it early on, especially using the view camera, you really wanted to be clear on what you were saying. So this idea of being on the stairs or being on a building mm -hmm. or being above yeah. was the most favorable way to show this uh, juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone to, by the way, have you ever gone to the Museum of Natural History to their picture collection? They have a remarkable, remarkable. No, it, it's the I mean, the, majo the majority of them are eight by 10 contact sheets. And it's both a record of everything that's in the museum as well as 100 years of archeological well, research. We should go. It's, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking about the, the use of the, um, of the satellite dish in some of your earlier work, obviously when a satellite dish was more, more prevalent. But it, it occurs to me that it's also, it, it's, it's a form of writing, it's a form of communication, it's a form of collecting, collecting information. Um, and perhaps has a relationship to the emoticon or to the cell phone or. It, I think that it's interesting, I think it, the, the fight between mm -hmm. this need of communication and this need to be present, this need of the screen, this need of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that we don't consider that actually the world in which this revolution that it's so slick mm -hmm. and so uh, mm -hmm. sensual is happening is a very archaic world still. Mm -hmm. I mean, the majority of Earth is built in a very cheap, mm -hmm. temporary way. Mm -hmm. I mean, even New York at times seemed kind of shaky mm -hmm. and uh, looks more like a city of 150 years ago than, mm -hmm. than now. Mm -hmm. I think we have a an idea of the present and of technology that is very illusionary. Mm -hmm. And in the reality, the landscape and the, w w the things are much more crude and much more archaic and dusty and mm -hmm. considering that um, the developed world is a very uh, small amount, mm -hmm. the rest it's as old as... Uh, well, may maybe it's a reflection of our own anxiety about mortality. And you know, no knowing that our time here is fleeting mm -hmm. and that so much of what we produce is equally as, as, as fleeting, is equally as, uh, as transient. Yeah, but, uh, but that doesn't help. I mean, to not, uh, to not uh, uh, no, find a, a yeah. dialogue with it, also through art or through literature or through theater or through music, it's kind of, mm -hmm. to not look at it, it's definitely less. Uh, it, this feels like a very, for a Sunday, uh, morning, a Sunday afternoon, this feels like a very ecclesiastical com conversation. No, we should open to yeah. questions of friends, should, should I, we? I want to ask you one more thing before we do that. You mentioned uh, ISIS for a moment mm. in, in, your, in your presentation. I was just thinking of, of, obviously there's parts of the world that are engulfed in conflict, and um, that has a enormous impact on their civilization and uh, the, the remnants of civilization. Do, does this interest you at all as a, as a topic? Um, to, 
to me it's interesting uh, the language they use or mm -hmm. to me it interests a lot this idea of destroying things and that really fascinates me of destroying things destroying yeah. things and yeah. especially destroying uh, this idea of destroying memory mm -hmm. um, I have a very um, strange opinion about it I'm not so a strange opinion yeah I'm not so scandalized about it huh. I think there is something very That's strange there is something very deep and very strange in this other culture and in this mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. that decides to be so specific to destroy something so precious. Mm -hmm. It looks like as if a kind of in instinct mm -hmm. uh, in the, for the times we're living, beside power, beside political tactics, mm -hmm. there is something very strange and very deep about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, I am sad and I am right. struck. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. But there is also something fascinating about mm -hmm. what, why mm -hmm. humankind decides to do that. Right. There's something I don't know. I think it talks about the present more than what we can admit. Yeah, we ca we Westerns we can't admit this unconscious mm -hmm. because I think they do what we also do. Sure, we're just doing it in a different way. Right, right. So one there's something argue, very one, instinctual, very yeah. deep the, 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 about the age we live mm -hmm. in that destruction. Mm -hmm. There's something very like clear. Yeah, it's very. I think it's very primal. Very. Very primal. Very primal, yeah. And there is something that we should pay attention to because it's mm -hmm. telling something very powerful and very specific about what we're doing to the mm -hmm. planet and to the culture yeah. and to, to our own community. That's an interesting... Not only their yeah. community. Right. Because as far as I'm concerned, we are all human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, one could argue that, that we have done as much to destroy not only that community, but also the world in general. And our own. Right. That, that the act of destruction throughout the Middle East might be more explicit explicit or, or yeah <laughs> or, or at, at least I think we are related hand in hand it's not the evil right there and the good here it's, it's actually I think we are hand in hand in this that's what fascinates me mm -hmm. there is something going around like a kind of common unconscious yeah. well maybe in a way that there, there are moments in your work that really celebrates the or, or, or at least acknowledges that the destruction of a civilization is an important part in its in its evolution Probably. But, uh, I don't remember who said that only ruining the ruins mm -hmm. you can build again. Mm -hmm. Some French utopian architect. I thought John Wayne said that. John Wayne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> should we talk? Branch is coming closer. Should we talk to these, these lovely people who came out? We should. Do, any questions or? I think, I mean, you see, the difference between the Greeks and the Romans, which is a huge difference, is that the Romans would find all possible ways to absorb the enemy and take them in their own account, in their own culture. They gave them the alphabet, they made them pay taxes, they leave them their religion. They just, uh, how do you say, absorb them, like encroach them. When the Greeks, they would not deal with the enemy deeper and after the battle. They were not really colonizer. They said that you need the enemy to be yourself. I mean, the Greeks had this very high respect of the enemy. The enemy is the enemy, I am me. We need each other to be. This, we fight, we find terms, but we need this difference. I think the Roman way has got through England, through America, has become our main uh, philosophy and consider that the alphabet we write and read and the magazine, the New York Times outside, it's written in Latin characters. So I think Rome is still lingering in, in its own uh, engineering of power. The Greeks were very different in this. It's uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, but it, I think destruction, destruction is a lot the theme. I mean, I think this, all these places are about destruction one way or another, or at least it's a common ground is coming to term with different forms of destruction and memory. With memory and photography and destruction, I think they, they, it's, they're a dinner together. Well, and, 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 and preservation, pho photographic yeah. preservation. Yeah, there is um, um, any, any other questions? I don't know, it just came to, thank you, Patrick. This brings us back to Earth. Uh, no, it came naturally, I think, to this thing of uh, inscriptions. 
And I don't know, there was something stylistic. I think also we witnessed the disappearance of good black and white lately. It's a part of photography that has slipped out. I thought I want, also in this term, I wanted to recover something. I said, let me, I mean, I use such a large format. Let me do a little bit of it by 10. It can be, it can be beautiful uh, in black and white. So it was purely central thing. And I think it related also with light and writing, even more about photography somehow. But. but I also think that it connects to the past more than perhaps the yeah, black and white, it's definitely more uh, memory related. Yeah. I don't know, Stephen. You know. <laughs> mm, I think it, it wasn't a decision. It just happened. It was like going back in time. I, well, recently I wrote a text that I had to, that I wasn't inspired, but I had to. And I really sat down and squeezed and squeezed. And it came this thing of like traveling in time. By the way, last, like three days ago is the anniversary of Back to the Future, the film. I mean, the, the, the date of the arrival of, uh, I think that's also kind of fascinating, kind of interesting. Was that the film that he was wearing uh, Calvin Klein underwear and everyone thought that that was his name? <laughs> yeah, I, I think was that. I think it's a yeah. notable. And then he was wearing also, I read an article on the plane coming from Milan uh -huh. that now Nike is making this self lacing uh, shoes, uh -huh. just like the one of uh, McFly that uh -huh. goes in 2015, he pushes the button and the Nike, zzz, which actually is what you buy in Nike Town now. I bought them yesterday. Are you going to get some? I was, yeah, I just yeah. bought them the other day. I, d I do think that you that that you have gone back into. I mean, it's it's the, like an archaeological well, project. You, you you know you started with the surface and you continue. I think it's a, there's also this Orphic thing of yeah. that and going underground. Mm -hmm. I think I'm out. <laughs> to not make it surely I do it to not make it too boring. I when I feel the picture, it's too. Uh, serious or too boring, I think introducing the, uh, well, I'm also very much in love with these things. So oh, it's a way to be with them. I mean, I want to be in the picture. No, uh, I do it first uh, for showing this presence. I want to be there. I've gone as far as there. I want to be there. And uh, it's also about uh, being um, with these things and making them also look like the ear they're taken in. Because the coat, the camera, the shoes, it represents 2011, 2008, 2009. So it's not a picture of 550 BC. It's not a picture of archaeology again, because that's not what I'm going for. It's a picture of me in that moment now. Do you find that redundant to, ha to have him in the picture? <laughs> yeah, because you're a friend of mine and you know me, so you, you're not impersonal. You have to think of somebody uh, exterior. In fact, it's not written in the titles. I don't think. No, no, in the titles, it's not written. I don't. I, I say it, or I tell the story if it comes up, but it's not a self-portrait. It is unconscious. It is in the picture, but not in the. It's not announced. Your presence, I think, is pretty generic in, in it, purposely so. What do you mean generic? You, you just look like a guy. I am a, a guy. I you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I I like that. I think uh -huh. it's more elegant. Mm -hmm. But if you know me, you see the shoes and uh -huh. the jacket. I mean, there's elements that I like that are, it, it makes it human. It makes this extreme lost thing uh -huh. more uh, familiar. Uh -huh. I think that's the point. I think that's why uh, I do it, to make it more uh, uh, intimate. Mm -hmm. Also for scale, but this is like the same black and white uh, yeah. issue. It's and, you're, and you're of average height, too. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, when <laughs> I had airs, I was even a little taller. <laughs> I, I think that it's a big problem to have all these uh, images and these things that are so unhuman in a very human uh, life. There is something kind of strange. I think the, the human uh, emotional uh, issue is quite crucial. To, to make something dead, alive, and, and, and human is also the point of a lot of the pictures. Natalie, you have to come before Christmas to Italy and see how many of these under, underwear advertising is around the city. It's just, the whole country's changed for Christmas, all in red. 
and stockings and but everywhere it's incredible it's like the culture give its best about photography in this kind of representational charade it's very interesting and it's really the it's a kind of idea of pictures that to me it's really uh, striking it sounds very exciting it, it is but in italy there is a lot of, of these things i mean <laughs> did you finish your thought natalie okay mm. Well, something else that I was thinking about over, over the weekend is, um, and I've been thinking about this for a while, but the landscape, landscape photography uh, is, is now, I think, a very vibrant genre. Um, and and it, it, can be a, it can be politicized, it can be you know, a, a part of one's therapeutic relationship to photography. Um, it could have a, you know, be, be part of a cultural matrix as, as you are, but um, it just seems to be a genre and a site that many, many people are exploring. And in the classroom, I'll sometimes say, well, do you consider yourself a landscape photographer? Just because there is so much landscape in an in a individual's body of work, and they say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm not landscape. I don't do landscapes. But, but because I so, think landscape is restrictive. I don't like landscape either. Right, so you too would say, no, I'm not, I'm not a landscape I'm photographer. also a landscape photographer, okay. but I also don't like to say I'm a photographer. Mm -hmm. Probably best not to. I, you know. I think it's easily, there are categories that are very easily abused mm -hmm. or generic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this thing of making picture with phones and making picture in all possible forms mm -hmm. has made the issue of be a photographer and make pictures of landscape or genres mm -hmm. very delicate. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be in a kind of box of these millions of repetitions. You want, mm -hmm. in fact, I consider a lot of the work much more sculptural than, than picture. Uh, what do you put down as your occupation when you when you I don't know. I change, come to the change. United States. Yeah. Uh, un unemployed, <laughs> which is true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any anything else? Shall we go to Chinese? Domingo's taking everyone out to brunch here. Yeah, but we share. No, we share. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Domingo, do you know um, Rachel Sussman's work? She is a, a fellow SVA graduate. I think she was probably a few years earlier than you, and she has a beautiful book. And the book, she has been um, photographing methodically, consistently photographing the oldest things on the planet. Um, you, you know the work? Yeah, you, yeah. Told, you told me when I came back from that trip uh, about the trees. Yeah. We photographed the same trees. Yeah. And, uh, Did you two meet? And we haven't met. Yeah. OK. You want to organize? Sure, yeah. OK. All right. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a, and thank you for coming, a great guys. pleasure. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>